Hello, hello, welcome to my channel. My name is Sophie. I want to talk to you about things from February. Biblio Sophie. So I said at the beginning of the year that I might discontinue monthly wrap ups because they are really, really useful for me to try to codify and formulate some thoughts on all the books that I finish in a given month, but I find them kind of stressful. And this is no exception. I'm finding myself a little bit camera shy at the idea of having to talk about the books that I read in February. However, I want to play around a little bit with how I'm doing this wrap up. I'm going to think more thematically. I'm also just going to add some various other things, some other mentions. So we've got, we're going to have one kind of big holistic theme and then some bonuses. So the big holistic theme tying a bunch of books that I finished this month is Heritage. I really am obsessed with the through line of Heritage and also how it connects to narrative in so many of the books that I read. Very beginning of the month, I read Martyr by Kaveh Akbar. I mentioned this in a vlog earlier in the month. I loved this book and this is so much to me about history, how personal history interacts with larger geopolitical history, with family history, and again, heritage. How heritage prescribes a given narrative for all of the characters in this book, but especially our main protagonist. How it is the history behind him, but also the history or the history to be made, the narrative ahead of him, and how he's trying to situate himself within that flow, how little or how much control he can have in those circumstances, and how the kind of narratives of everybody around him also kind of convolute together. So to me, this was so much about inheritance and heritage. Similarly, another book which I loved and read this month was Dicté by Teresa Hakyung Cha. This is about personal archaeology, personal archaeology within self, within a family and a family memoir, and within a whole culture. This is narrative, constructing narrative as a means of creating or recreating a heritage, trying to sift through the past. Uh, this is part poem, part personal memoir, part family history collage. I heartily recommend this book as well as I did in my vlog. And what this also for me really gets at is the matter of heritage and narrative, the stuff of it. Uh, one of the last few pages of the book addresses this and throughout the book, the, the act of writing and composing and making is such an important component in the act of finding and of being within a narrative, within a certain heritage. Words cast each by each to weather, avowed indisputably to time. If it should impress, make fossil trace of word, residue of word, stand as a ruin stands, simply as mark having relinquished itself to time to distance. On the subject of matter and stuff, I want to talk about Art Monsters by Lauren Elkin, another book which I loved. This is about uh, female artists, visual artists, most specifically, but not entirely. Um, from a lot of different vantage points, uh, this feels a little like an encyclopedia. You could delve so much deeper into so many of these artists, um, but to me it made me uh, curious and um, inspired to look more into some of these artists and think about them further. The writing is really beautiful in this as well. It is also very personal and I love that. Commentary on art through a essayistic personal lens that's well written. That's, that is, that's one of my catnips. 
at the end of a section called Aki. I actually posted a uh, photo of this um, citation on Instagram at the very beginning of February, or maybe actually at the very end of January, I'm not sure. Um, but this is a good reminder also of the, the actual kind of physical stuff of heritage in terms of what gets passed down of stuff through time. I wonder if her changing, aging body was at the root of her intuition that it was necessary to speak of our public and private lives at the same time, that one was not possible without the other. To be in a body is to live with failure, to acknowledge eventual decay, to tell the truth of one's experiences within that body has to involve making room for failure and decay in one's practice. Like Wolf's, Hesse's work was a question of throwing in her luck with materiality and its uncertain futures. Life is matter. Matter has limits. Form has consequences. Which I adore. Meanwhile, if you've read East of Eden by John Steinbeck, you know that heritage is a gigantic component of this book. It's an allegorical retelling of Genesis and specifically Cain and Abel. And as such, genealogy, family connections, and passing down traits, passing down an inheritance, is basically what the book is about. But there's materiality in that inheritance. It shows up, of course, in physical traits, as well as the kind of mental, emotional traits of the characters. It has to do with land, because farming is such an important part of uh, these characters' lives but it's also smaller objects. And I was really caught by a uh, conversation between two characters, Samuel and Lee, in which they're talking about a physical Bible. Of course, the Bible is going to be a very, very important part of this book, of these families. It's a biblical retelling, but the actual object has an import. And Samuel says, I wonder what agonies have settled here. Give me a used Bible and I will, I think, be able to tell you about a man by the places that are edged with the dirt of seeking fingers. Memories leave literal physical imprints on the objects in our lives. Back to the also the idea of narrative and inheritance, so much of this book is not just about the families that are being taught talked about, excuse me, but about the act of writing a story, because John Steinbeck is an important character, a not very often seen character, but he is, his authorial voice is an important character in this book. There is sometimes some first person narrative when where we remember that this is not some sort of absolute story. There is a point of view. That comes just really overtly um, about 180 pages in. He has previously described Kathy, very contested character, very interesting character, as a monster. And he now admits a few chapters later, when I said Kathy was a monster, it seemed to me that it was so. Now I have bent close with a glass over the small print of her, and reread the footnotes, and I wonder if it was true. First of all, that's a beautiful sentence. I also really, really love this idea of having to do some archaeology, even of your own narrative that you've set up. How much autonomy does this character have? How much agency does she have to be herself? And how much kind of inherent truth does he know having created her. This goes with a certain hardness of taxonomy and of description. The lack of agency or of freedom that can result from having a certain thing being known or assumed about you, and to a certain extent having a heritage can mean that. Having a heritage can be a comforting thing or it can be a sort of damnation. That's what we're seeing regularly 
in East of Eden on an individual character level and then kind of on a more familial level, we can also see it on a much larger cultural level. Dark Days is an essay by James Baldwin, um, and the very opening of it has the sentence, says, to be black was to confront and to be forced to alter a condition forged in history. To be white was to be forced to digest a delusion called white supremacy. So part of an inheritance, a written narrative about you as a person comes with something that is forged in history. And I'll use that as a transition to get into Simone de Beauvoir, Pour une morale de l'ambiguïté, The Ethics of Ambiguity, which is not about hard-edged uh, taxonomies and hard-edged narratives, but rather about trying to dissolve those. What is freedom? What freedom can we find in ambiguity? There are so many hard-edged truths about the world, which are, by virtue of their hard-edgedness, always on the verge, or also simultaneously, fallacies. And there is constant active freedom and the act of freeing through an attempt to live in an ambiguous place. This is partially a dissolution of hard-edged taxonomy, and it's also partially an embracing of kind of multiple failures. It's a constant renewal process. Rather appropriately, my phone fell over. There is much more I could say about all of these, they're very interesting and rich texts, but for now, or maybe forever, I leave you with these tidbits and some tendrils connecting them and what's kind of been roiling around in my mind. Speaking of tidbits, you see that, that sequitur? Some other tidbits of the month. I reread Le Tartuffe by Molière. This is a play. This is a play about fakery and class and uh, reputation, let's say. I had not read this since I was probably 12 or 13, and it was great fun to revisit. Some things that I've been reading that aren't really in collections, I've been reading some George Oppen. I did read a short collection of his of early poems uh, called 21 Poems, uh, but also just some one-off poems. I've also really been reading the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish and really enjoying that, but not in any uh, one collection. And as I mentioned, I've been reading a fair amount of James Baldwin uh, recently, but not long form essay collections. So that didn't make it into my finished books of the month. Some movies that I want to talk about. Yeah, we're doing movies now too. Uh, I read La Règle du... not read. <laughs> I watched. You can tell that I'm used to talking about things I read. I watched La, La Règle du Jeu by uh, Jean Renoir from 1939. Actually, this is semi-connected to Tartuffe um, because it is a sort of comedy or maybe dramedy of manners. It is very much an upstairs, downstairs farce about class and hypocrisy. It's an extremely famous French classic, so this is not a hot take to tell you that it's good and you should watch it. I had never watched it before, so I'm glad that I have. Also not a hot take, Phantom Thread by Paul Thomas Anderson is good. I had also never watched that, and that was tremendously fun and interesting and a little bit uncomfortable sometimes, too. And I watched All of Us Strangers by, uh, directed by Andrew Haig, and that was beautiful. Unsurprisingly, I loved it as well, and deeply melancholy and sad in a good way. Um, so those are some movies that I particularly liked this month. Phantom Thread uses uh, the Debussy string quartet, so if you're wanting some music recommendation, yeah, we're doing music too. If you haven't listened to the Debussy String Quartet, 
listen to it. All of these are going to be string quartet things. I'm, I'm on a specific theme. It's so good. The movie uses the Emerson Quartet recording and it's a great recording, so I recommend it. Listen to that full quartet. It's so good. On the topic of classical string quartets, the Bartok uh, fourth string quartet, I'm going to recommend the third movement, which is a slow ish movement um and it's gorgeous and i recommend the talkish quartet uh recording and then newer um classical excuse me that's the word i'm looking for for a newer classical string quartet sound i'm going to recommend a uh caroline shaw piece that has been on my mind this month because i performed it i learned and performed it so it was in my ear a lot uh and so is on her recent album Evergreen, uh, in which she is performing with a taka quartet. And all three of those, String Quartet and String Quartet Plus, uh, and so also has voice, are very interesting. You know, assuming you like quartet music, classical music, but check them out. And finally, I'm going to leave you with some Pauline Oliveros and deep listening. I suggest you look into her if you're at all interested in the intersection of music, poetry, performance, meditation, movement, and I've been spending a fair amount with, of time with her work the past couple of weeks and I'm going to continue to do so, so she's also on my mind and I bring her to you. This uh, is a series of instructions for a score, a meditation. Listen. During any one breath, make a sound. Breathe. Listen outwardly for a sound. Breathe. Make exactly the sound that someone else has made. Breathe. Listen inwardly. Breathe. Make a new sound that no one else has made. Breathe. Continue this cycle until there are no more new sounds. Bye-bye.